Good evening again. <laughs> As uh, you know, uh, most of you were here when I spoke in October. So these are just some of the experiences that I had during World War II. My uh, profession, as you might see it, was in bomb disposal. And I'm just going to give you a little review because there are one or two things that I missed. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Turn the other mic off, please. Move, move your mic over. Uh, no, shut it off. Shut it off. Feedback. Cut the wire. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the speaker uh, Turn the speaker around a bit, away. No, not in there, on the speaker. The speaker on the table. Oh, on the table. Yeah, it's not picking it up. Move it forward and turn it toward the door. No, the other way. There. Okay. Now you can hear me. Oh, we can hear you fine. <laughs> Well, I, I'm going to go back to, well, I'm not going to repeat an awful lot of that, but uh, the other night I was uh, tuned into the History Channel and they had a, believe it or not, Ripley thing on. And so I picked up one thing that I forgot to tell you that happened over in England. This is a believe it or not, and it, this has actually happened. When I was assigned at that time to the uh, ground forces in England, uh, as you know, I was trained by the RAF. Well, by the time I got to London, they gave me over to the ATS. And so then uh, I worked for London area. And we went out to the field, and when we took the bomb up, we took the base plate off and burned the charge out. So, the, and I told you that, how they could reuse the metal. Britain was that short of metal. They reused the, the bomb casing back in their smelters for war purposes. But while we were out in that field one day, uh, there was a, uh, a dud bomb not too far from some of the buildings, and uh, it had never been dug up until well, when we were out there, it was decided that it should be dug up because it was uh, a nuisance, actually. And uh, uh, it wasn't doing anything in particular, but they decided that they, this is the British now, decided that uh, it should be dug up. So they dug the hole down, and uh, you know, the British, uh, they're very uh, conscious of uh, a rating. <laughs> so the, the royalty uh, becomes officers automatically in the, the British system. So they had a British officer go down to defuse this bomb. Now, the, the hole was fairly narrow, and it was a fairly big bomb, about a 500 pounder. Uh, and uh, uh, it was uh, a German bomb. And so he went down into the hole and straddled the bomb just uh, like this. And at the top of the hole, this hole is approximately uh, 10 feet deep, plus or minus a foot. And uh, at the top of the hole were three officers, British officers, that had just become officers and had never seen the German bomb before. And so they wanted to go and see uh, how uh, we operated. So while he was down there, uh, and these three fellows were standing around the hole, and he was on top, the uh, diffuser was on top of the, the bomb. The bomb went off. When he lifted the fuse, it went off. It was apparently a booby trap. Now he was to straddle the bomb like this. He blew out of the hole. I don't know how high, because we were a little ways away, we heard the explosion. He flew out of the hole and came down and landed, and all he had was a broken wrist. All he had was a broken wrist. Of the three men at the top, standing around the hole, two were found at the bottom of the hole, dead. The other one was blown right out a little bit, but the two at the top were blown. Now you wonder, how could this happen? Well, there's a, a real explanation for it. One is that if you're in contact with anything, you ride with it. And that's what happened to the man on the, on the bottom. 
He was awful lucky. <laughs> but it's a believe it or not. <laughs> but when you have an explosion, you have a vast amount of air being exposed. And when that hole is now a vacuum, it sucked the two men back in. And with such force that it killed them at the bottom. And I'm mentioning that, and I'll get to it. I might not mention this, this particular thing, but as I talk, you are going to come across another incident later on. But I'm going to skip now to Algiers. There are a few things in Algiers that I haven't mentioned before. And uh, as you know, I was with the, I was then assigned to the 15th Bomb Disposal Squad. That was under Montgomery's uh, 8th Army, but he was way over in the desert, and this was over at Algiers now. Because you, you know that uh, the British took the city of Algiers. Their navy actually took that city. But the, our 36th Air Depot group took the airfield. <laughs> and while we were out there, and I was assigned to this group, we were uh, out in the field. I was the only American uh, working with this group. Um, we were out in the field, and we came across a ravine that was just loaded with German bombs. See, they, they had put them there for, the, for their own aircraft. When, the, when they had the, the airfield, that was their supply dump. Now that, I mention this because it was in a ravine and there were trees around it and it was fairly cool uh, compared to the rest of the surrounding territories, the open spaces. And uh, I didn't notice too much at the time, but it, that stuck in my mind. Later on, when uh, I was assigned, uh, this about a month and a half later, I was assigned to the Northwest African Air Force. As I told you about my boss Erskine coming along, and he got me into Northwest African Air Forces. And so uh, I was at headquarters, and one day the colonel came up. He was the, the Colonel Lind was the commanding officer of the Ordnance Department. And uh, this is under Northwest African Air Forces now, not for 12th yet. But uh, he mentioned that our aircraft didn't have any American bombs left. <laughs> the, the shipment hadn't arrived from the United States. This was, occasionally, we lost some of our ships coming across the sea, and so we ran short of ammunition and bombs. So I told my boss, I said, well, I know whether some German bombs, just that was a, more or less of a joke. And he said, oh, well, let's go out and get them. Let's see, take a look. So uh, he called the, uh, uh, the ordinance uh, to get a truck to go out there. And there were, wasn't anything available, nothing available. But they did have a German Jeep, <laughs> a bright yellow German Jeep with a swastika on the side. <laughs> so he, he looks at me and he says, can you drive a German Jeep? <laughs> and I said, well, I think I could drive it, but you better paint that swastika over. <laughs> and, and they did. They painted it over and put an American flag, passed the American flag to the front. So we went on out. I drove it on out to this area where the bombs were. When I got out there, he took a look and, and the size them up pretty good. And uh, between the two of us, we decided, well, we can drop these bombs back on the Germans. <laughs> the only thing is, you have to realize that the German bomb was fused on the uh, diameter of the, a pocket on the diameter of the bomb. American bombs had either a nose or a tail fuse, or both. And so you had to reconstruct the fusing mechanism and the, uh, the racks in the bomb base in order to accommodate this. So we went back and, and we, uh, we did the job. <laughs> we, we figured it out and while uh, my boss was out uh, getting some of the maintenance work done on, on the new fuses, there's uh, two, two American uh, naval people came in. And uh, one was a captain and the other was a uh, a lieutenant or a, a junior grade lieutenant. And uh, they walked in to the headquarters and they asked to see the uh, commander. And uh, he went up and, and uh, talked to them. And so uh, Erskine was out in the field at the time, as I said, 
finally got these fuses uh, made up. And uh, so uh, the colonel said, well, go down and see Sergeant Harton down there, and he'll take care of you. So uh, the one fellow said, uh, did you say Hartman? And the uh, colonel said, yes. So he said, OK. They came down, and we're talking. And they had a freighter that had been hit by a German bomb that penetrated the top deck. And it landed on top of a whole hold of American bombs. That, that's where our American bombs were. This freighter had been hit. And the, the bomb didn't blow off, fortunately. If it had gone off, it would have blown the city of Algiers. It would not be here today. But they got the, the ship as far as they could and then anchored it way out. And they evacuated the ship. And these two officers came in and said, now we need some help. We want somebody to go out there and take this dead bomb out so we can get our bombs. So I was elected. But when we're talking, this one officer said, by the way, Sergeant, where are you from? And I said, well, my hometown, my home was down in New Jersey. And he said, by any chance, was it in Plainfield? I said, yes. That's where I was inducted from. And he stuck out his hand and said, I'm your new brother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> he, he said, well, not really yet, but when I get back home, I'm going to be burying your sister. <laughs> I'm actually at home. So that's how I met my brother-in-law. These, these kind of things don't happen to everybody. <laughs> but anyhow, it wasn't much of a job to take that uh, bomb out. It happened to be uh, uh, an armor-piercing type uh, fuse in it, and it was easy to get out. And once I got uh, the fuse out, uh, and it was right, as I say, over a bunch of bombs, they had the rigging's all set, all we had to do was lift that one out and put it out in the ocean, <laughs> out in the Mediterranean, <laughs> and uh, the rest, then they were able to bring the ship in and we used the rest of those bombs. That's some of the things that happened down into Algiers there. So, uh, uh, at the set, after that incident, the, uh, there's one other time I've, uh, there was a German G mine. I, I don't know if you're familiar with any of these things like that, but uh, uh, of all the mines that were ever dropped from the sky at that time, the German G mine was the biggest. It had to come down by parachute, and the airplanes could only carry one of these. Roughly, it was, uh, well, it was bigger than this table, and it was a high explosive, and it wasn't, it really looked like a, uh, like a big tin can on end. <laughs> it, it didn't have much of a shape to it. But the darn thing had six pocket fuses in it. And so when this was dropped, it was dropped for the purpose, the first one that was ever dropped was dropped uh, over London. And uh, that's how I got to know something about it. But uh, that one, uh, they uh, were able to defuse it, all right. And uh, this one happened to land in a place called Maison Curie, which is oh, about halfway between Maison Blanc and the city of Algiers. And it's, uh, Maison Curie is the big marshalling yards for Northwest Africa. Uh, so they had a lot of trains coming in from the, the seaport and, and uh, things like that. When the bomb landed, it was dropped at night, and when the bomb landed, the parachute just fell over the top of this mine, big mine. And so there's a, uh, some people in the marshalling yard, and they saw this thing come down, they heard it, saw it come down, and so they immediately notified Allied forces, which was uh, under Major Tobin of the British at the time. So as I told you, I lost that first officer, and so I was then in charge of the, the 15th bomb disposal group. And so they called me. So I went out and I, I took a look at it, and it was a, it was a hairy one. So that uh, imagine uh, now having six possibilities of this darn thing going off. <laughs> so 
some of the fuses in there, uh, it, these are the possibilities that you had. One of the fuse pockets deployed the parachute. So you didn't have to worry about that as pyrotechnic type. But when the parachute come down over the, this big tin can, <laughs> why, uh, it gave it a, 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 everything under it was closed off and dark. And that was a break, because one of the fuses was light sensitive. One, one was a time fuse. One was an anti-magnetic, a magnetic type fuse. And did I mention the noise? One was a noise fuse. But with all these fuses, various fuses, uh, I knew the possibility, but I didn't know exactly which one to take first. <laughs> so I got lucky, and uh, I did the job. <laughs> but uh, that, I don't think that is recorded any place because it, we, everything was secret at the time. We didn't want the enemy to know that we knew something about their mind. That was the, the last. German G mine that was dropped, incidentally. They dropped two of them, one in England, one down in Africa. Neither one went off, <laughs> so they gave up, <laughs> which, was, which was okay with me. <laughs> uh, so while, uh, while all this was going on, uh, Erskine had uh, successfully made the fuses for the uh, the German bombs. So we decided we'd uh, get a B-25. We had a B-25 assigned to us at the, uh, in the Air Force headquarters. And so we took one, uh, well, we took two of the bombs and put them in a rack in a B-25 and figured, well, now we better test fly these things and see if they're gonna really work. So Erskine and I got in the back and uh, in, this, in this 25 we had a big hole cut I mean, it was built in that way, so we could mount cameras in it, and we could take the, uh, we could look down through this hole. So Erskine and I are in the back of this B-25, we take off with the two German bombs in the bomb bay, and we go out over the Mediterranean, uh, we're up about 10,000 feet, and the pilot was okay, and the, and the navigator was okay, we had a tail gunner in the back, but we didn't have any communication with any of them. We're standing around this, this uh, where the cameras are. So we're flying along and uh, all of a sudden the bomb bay opens and the two bombs fall and we're looking like this. And okay, but they went down and they went off. Everything worked fine. But with that, the pilot decides we better go down and take a closer look. So here this hole is open. The air is rushing up. And he peels off just like that. Erskine and I go right to the roof. <laughs> and we're looking down through this hole, and we figure when he levels off, we're going to go down through the hole. <laughs> well, even though, oh boy, we sweat. But anyhow, er Erskine was a great guy. He said, put your hands out. We put our hands out like that, so if we did go down, we might break our arms, but we weren't going to go through that hole. <laughs> Actually, we hit our bottoms on the deck. <laughs> just alongside of it. But those are some of the things that, you know, you're not so apt to have uh, happen. <laughs> um, uh, soon after, uh, after that, Erskine, uh, well, uh, after, the, that's about the, the major incidents that happened that I didn't tell you before uh, in Algiers. And then I told you how we went over to uh, Bizerta and we got on uh, LST number three and made the invasion of Sicily. I think you remember parts of that. We worked our way all the way over to Lakata. And while we were at Lakata, we finished running that minefield over there, the beaches over there. And we got word that uh, we had to get over to Ragusa. Now this, you have Gila here, that's where we land, and Lakata here, and Ragusa's over here, and Syracuse over here. So we got over to Ragusa, and uh, some of the uh, rangers that were on board our LST had 
said that got into contact with us, Erskine and myself, and said that they had come across some rockets. Now, up until that time, there were no rockets fired from the, the shores of any of the uh, lower parts of Europe or Italy or anything like that. The rockets that were fired from the mainland of Europe toward England were uh, mostly V2 type rockets, so V1, V2, and the threes. And these were uh, propelled uh, differently than the Venturi tubes. They were propelled by uh, much the same type of fusing now that, uh, that our rockets used to go to the moon. But uh, these particular ones had a Venturi fuse to them and uh, a propulsion in them. And when we came across them, they were still on the pallet. They had never been, uh, they, they had been dropped there by the Germans, but they didn't get a chance to use them. So that, uh, there's a picture in here someplace <laughs> of, uh, of those rockets, if you care to look at them. Uh, incidentally, all of these pictures that I have here, you'll see German bombs, you'll see American bombs, and things of that sort. You're free to go up and, after I talk, you're free to go up and take them. You can take them in your hand, and you might want to turn them over and see what's on the back, uh, because there's four of the of, uh, different things on there. But all of these are pictures of actual things that, that happened uh, that we came across. Uh, well, uh, after uh, after we got through with that job at the Hussa, incidentally, we did. The German planes were still taking off from that little airport where the, the Rangers had come in, and, but they weren't successful in closing down the airport. Uh, there, it was a fighter field, and the last plane was just going off about the time that we were looking at these rockets, which were maybe a, a couple hundred yards away. But uh, uh, that, that last plane didn't make it. it uh, and it, the, the Rangers shot it down before it got off. But, uh, that night we sacked out in the barn. Uh, this is the way that we, we had to operate. We weren't with a unit. We were independent of ourselves. We had to go wherever the call came. Sometimes we didn't have enough food. Sometimes we, uh, there were 35 days in a row. I didn't even get out of my uniform. And my uniform was the ODs. <laughs> We, that's all I had. <laughs> and uh, sometimes we had a uh, scramble for food, and we had to uh, go into other outfits and ask them for food. But we did have a, a vehicle, and uh, so we had over, we got a call to go over to the city of Syracuse. Now, Syracuse was another town, city, that was captured by the British. And uh, they wouldn't have anything to do with any of the other Allied forces going into Syracuse. That was their territory. I, I don't know if you know, but going up through Sicily, on the one side, you had the, the British going up and uh, coming across, you had the Americans, and it was a race. It was a race between the two to see who was gonna get the publicity. Well, when we got to uh, Syracuse, they wanted us to defuse some of their, some. Uh, German bombs that were down along the harbor. And uh, so uh, when they saw that, uh, as we appeared, uh, Erskine went up to the guard and, and told them that, uh, who we were and what's up. And uh, they said, well, he could go in, but I couldn't because I was not an officer. <laughs> so Erskine said, no way, I'm not going to go by myself. He's, he wasn't that confident. We, we, we worked as a team. And it, it won't say the other, you know. But uh, uh, so uh, they decided, well, the only way we could handle this thing was they, they called over, there was a ranger outfit nearby, they called over a ranger officer, and they swore me in as a lieutenant. <laughs> <laughs> so I had I was on a battlefield commission to go into the city of Syracuse to take up a few lousy bombs, and then, when I came in, they, they treated us good. They, they put us up for the night in a hotel. I first time I saw a hotel in a year and a half. <laughs> but anyhow, 
uh, when I left, uh, I was still wearing a bar. Uh, what happened was they, I had stripes on, and so I had to roll my sleeves up to cover them. I put the tennis scars on me, and uh, they, he swore me in as a commission officer. So that was okay. Which <laughs> army? So anyhow, when we uh, uh, finished that job, we headed over toward uh, uh, Edna, which is uh, was not an active volcano, but you all heard of the Mount, Mount Edna oh, yeah, in Sicily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when we got there, there was a fierce uh, battle going on between a bunch of tanks. Now, I say a bunch of tanks, and that's what it was. Our American tanks, uh, they, they, well, they just couldn't knock out a German uh, Mark IV. They could uh, do a little damage, but uh, it took it took uh, a captain from the armored uh, group to take and line up five tanks abreast. Two or three of those tanks, incidentally, were old Italian tanks. <laughs> we didn't have enough American tanks left. And coming down through the valley, there were hundreds, uh, literally hundreds. So uh, now I'm telling you a story which, during the course of uh, one daylight raid, 120 Mark IVs, German Mark IVs, were knocked out by this method. This guy realized uh, this captain, and uh, he was in Patton's army, and Patton knew nothing about this, how he had it, but he had them line them up five abreast and had them pointed down toward the valley. And uh, he had five here, five here, five there, and a big long line on the, the hilltops. And when the Germans came into that valley, it gave the orders, these five fire, <laughs> and every other odd ones fired, they would reload, and then the in, one, in between ones went. And that saved the day. So, Patton being a general that he was, <laughs> he ordered his, after the battle, he ordered his forces to go up toward Palermo. But, and in order to go that route, he had to go down through this battlefield and into this, a few little towns in order to go into Palermo. Well, we had skirted it, Erskine and I had skirted it, we had headed up to Palermo too. But uh, uh, on the way, uh, this, this is the type of a, and I don't want to run every general down, but this general, <laughs> he sent his tanks up into small towns without the infantry. They, they outran the infantry. And the, at nightfall, these tanks were in narrow alleys, and the Germans simply dropped their hand grenades from on top, and they did, they knocked out quite a few of our tanks. Now, you know, I have to mention some of these things. Poor George, he's not around anymore. <laughs> yeah, tell me. But uh, that, that's uh, an instance. That, well, then we went on to Palermo. When we got to Palermo, we had, uh, we were getting pretty tired about that time, but we found a place to sleep. And uh, it was on the King's Garden, in the King's Garden, behind a wall, overlooking the nice Mediterranean. And we, Erskine and I sacked out there behind the wall, and uh, there was a little fighting going on, but not much at that time. And uh, in the morning, when we, when we finally got awake, and uh, we slept kind of late that day, uh, we heard a lot of racket coming up through the street. Who was it? General George Patton, on the back of a command car, Waving to everybody, he had conquered the city of Lyon. <laughs> <laughs> so, from there, we were sent, Erskine and I were flown back to Algiers. And uh, in the meantime, our outfit was moving up, that is, the headquarters outfit, had moved up to Tunis. So, we quickly got up to Tunis. And uh, uh, around the city of Tunis, on the Mediterranean shores, is a little town called the Marsa. And uh, we had uh, the headquarters unit put up big army tanks, you know those, those uh, tanks rather. Uh, you know the big army tanks, uh, 
Sleep what? six to a <laughs> ten for <laughs> life. No, not the about ten. The big ones. The big ones. Right on the beach. No cover whatsoever. A German plane could have come down and ripped them all apart. But anyway, so that's where we were housed on the beach. And so when Erskine and I arrived, they decided, well, we better look out at the beach over and the houses over for booby traps and things of that nature. Fortunately, uh, we found a, a number of them, but we didn't get there soon enough for one person. One fellow found one of these grenades, and uh, it was a German grenade, and he picked it up, and he decided he would, uh, I don't know if you know, a German grenade is shaped uh, like, oh, much like a duck egg, uh, as big as a duck egg, and uh, very light. Uh, no, no fragmentation part, just a tin type shape of it. There was a blast grenade. And on top was a little button uh, made of wood, and attached to that was a string. And when you pulled the string out, that would activate it. So you would take your grenade like this, and when you pulled like this, that activated it, and you would throw it, and you had a couple seconds. Well, they had booby trapped some of these grenades. And this one fellow picked it up, and he started to unscrew it. That was the end of it. So that's the kind of thing we were running into. But we found quite a few of that, and then they asked us to, <laughs> the Germans played all kinds of tricks. Uh, booby traps were uh, pretty prevalent during that area. Uh, so were mines, some of the mines. Now, uh, there weren't any particular mines there, but inland, there was the Bounce and Betsy. I don't I guess maybe some of you might have heard about the Bounce and Betsy. But this was a son of a gun of, a, of a, a mine because they would be placed underground or under leaves or uh, camouflaged of some sort in a, just a can sitting there and they'd run a trip wire out or up into a branch or uh, underneath the, the, the weeds or whatever. And all you had to do was walk by, trip this wire and this thing would blow up. Well, it also had a three prong like that on top, but if you happened to step on it, why, you were right under, that, that was right under you. Well, that particular mine was designed to have two explosives. When you tripped the wire or stepped on it, it, it ignited one fuse that would send the bomb, the, the mine casing, up about this high, and the second one would go up. Well, if you're coming up like this, and that second one goes off right about here, you had it. You had it. it was, that was loaded with steel balls, and you were dead. There was no doubt about it. But that was, that was a, uh, some of the war things that uh, went on were, well, they were devastating. Uh, you know, you just hated to do it. But I think we should all know about it. People should know about it. I'm, I'm dead set against mines. I think our country should ban mines because they don't do any good. They, they deny the advancing troops for uh, all maybe a couple days or so. But in today's warfare, you go around them, or you go over, or you do as we did uh, when we came across the field. We, we took some goats and cows, and we said, shoot them across there. And so we had some hamburger by the time we got to work, but, but we didn't lose any men. And, and we did, another thing we did, we took tanks, uh, the British did this in particular, and in the front we extended arms out with a bunch of chains on a wheel, and we used it as a flail. That was, that was partially successful, not entirely, but partially successful. But mines, are there still thousands of them throughout Europe, and the, and what do they do? But they kill civilians. They kill children, men, women, children, you know. So I'm against mines. They, they really don't. Today's warfare has changed so much so I don't think we, it's, our government should ban them. And if, if the American army bans them, the others will too. They'll see that they'll get the light on them. But uh, uh, let's see. Uh, so those, uh, I don't have any pictures of the flail there, but I think you'll see some of the mines in, in the minefield. Uh, another thing that happened at uh, La Barca 
was that uh, the, the officers wanted to use the, this Lamar's incident was uh, a nice beach area and it was where the elite spent their vacation. So they had a good swimming area and they had a pier going out. And when the Germans left, they took all their unused ammunition and stuff they couldn't carry with them. They dumped it off the pier to deny swimming for the new groups coming in. <laughs> so lo and behold, what do the officers want? They want to go swimming. So they called us and said, you guys, take care of the, of the, the dump out there. Well, I'm not much of a swimmer, <laughs> but uh, we managed to, to clear it out. We got about a truckload of this stuff out. We said, OK, the rest of it now is out far enough that you just put a line out there. You don't swim beyond that line. <laughs> but uh, these are some of the things that went on. But at this particular time, uh, the, we, we had, uh, we were only there, well, maybe a week or so, when uh, Eisenhower came in. And uh, as I told you, I had met Eisenhower once before back in Algiers, but uh, he, was, he was now the commander. <laughs> and so he came into, uh, uh, into the town of La Marsa, and he decided he wanted to have a headquarters, his own quarters set up. So he came over and he asked, uh, came over and asked for me, and uh, I went over and looked over this building so that he could occupy it. There was a, happened to be a machine gun messed up on the roof. These were flat roof parts, and they all looked to see as well. And uh, there was a, one or two instances where uh, there were some things left behind that were explosive nature. One happened to be a swastika flag. <laughs> which was baked over a, uh, well, it was a, like a hand grenade type thing. But anyhow, I cleared the, uh, the house for uh, Eisenhower and he came out <coughs> and uh, thanked me. And then he moved into that house. That was the last time I had seen him. But at about this time, uh, it was, the, the war was going on into Italy. And you all know something about how uh, there was some question, where, would, where were we going to land? Was it going to be Sicily? Was it going to be uh, over in the Balkans? Was it going to be Sardinia or where? But uh, when we went into, uh, uh, that was uh, at, uh, at the invasion of Sicily, but when we went into Italy, they weren't quite sure either whether we were going to go hit Sardinia first or where we were going to go into uh, use Sicily as a springboard and go right into the southern part of Italy. Well, <laughs> our forces, the, our army decided we'd go into an area just below Naples. And we got our family kicked with the 45th Division one in there. And they, in the history of the United States, that outfit, the 45th Division, spent more time in the trenches than any group in the history of the United States, a hundred and, I think it was 120 days in a row without relief. And boy, they got slaughtered. Fortunately, I didn't get into that part of it. Uh, I was sent over and nursed them, and we went into Sardinia, but that was, that was a cakewalk, it was no, no problem there. So the next thing we did was we went into Naples, into the port of Naples, and uh, when we arrived, the, the Germans had already left, basically, but they had bombed it pretty heavily. And uh, so the, when we arrived, uh, I don't know, some of you may have been in Naples. Have you been in Naples? Yeah. Well, do you know where the, the port area is? If you go from the port area going up toward the interior, maybe about five or six blocks, there's a big wide roads and uh, a lot of sturdy buildings there. Well, some of these buildings up at the top hill had been bombed out, and so we were called into, uh, they thought there was some duds in there, but, but the fires were still raging. And Risk and I went up, and we looked, and we said, well, we'll wait a little while. <laughs> so uh, the Red Cross came along, and uh, they invited us over to spend the evening with the Red Cross, which was very nice. We finally got a chance to relax a little bit. 
But after we left there, we got assigned to the city of Foggia. Now, Foggia is about uh, halfway the distance across the diameter, right, going east of uh, Naples, over toward, well, a little <laughs> north of Barry. And so uh, that was the slide, that would be the headquarters then for now the 12th Air Force. The 12th Air Force was now pretty big. It took in the fighters, it took in the, the bombers, and uh, uh, it, it was a pretty huge thing. Oh, I want to go back to one, one, one part. Back at Lamarsa, uh, one, one night we got called out at about 3 o'clock in the morning, and uh, they said, oh, they had some American bombs on a runway over on the other side of Tunis. Well, you get waking up about 3 o'clock in the morning to go over and take up some bombs, you're not too happy. So we got in the jeep and we went over and uh, uh, sure enough, one of our B-24s, maybe one of you guys did this job. <laughs> one of the B-24, this was going to be a big raid. Uh, they had about uh, maybe 100, 150 B-24s already in the air circling around. The fighters had not taken off yet. And uh, they were taking more planes off when one of them went down the runway and something happened, the bomb bay opened and the American bombs came out of the bomb bay and just cluttered the runway. Well, that stopped all operations. You couldn't take any airplanes off and you couldn't land any airplanes. So we got the call. By the time we got there, it was already, well, it took us a little while to get there, maybe half hour or so. And uh, instead of running right out and picking up the bombs so these guys could get down out of the air, Erskine says, goes into the commanding officer and he said, well, he looked around like this, he said, what have you got in the footlocker? He knew darn well what was in that footlocker. He knew it was good old scotch whiskey. <laughs> so he sat down, he negotiated with the commander. And the commander, he had nothing to, he, he had nothing to negotiate with except the, the liquor. But anyhow, uh, Erskine said, well, why don't you put that locker in the back of that truck out there? <laughs> and the commander doesn't know what to say. But anyhow, he, he, he thought, well, maybe a bottle or two would do the trick. But uh, we took the, the bombs up and uh, uh, as we took them out, we, we got them into trucks, and we took them out onto a big sandy hill. Well, uh, some of the planes were then allowed to land, and those that hadn't taken off, all the crews were standing around watching us take these up, and they, uh, they followed us up to this hill. Here we have a truckload of American bombs, or damaged bombs, and uh, we're going up there to get rid of them, to blow them up when we got a chance. So we're looking behind us, and here comes a trail of officers, gunners, bombardiers, navigators, hundreds of them coming, coming up, following us up to this hill with a truckload of bombs. So there's <laughs> consists, let's play it to the hill. <laughs> so we, we, didn't, we didn't want any audience. We had to get rid of those guys. So uh, I pulled the tail pins on the truck, and, and uh, that's, that's the way we got rid of them. Uh, we dumped the trucks that way. We'd run them off the hill, slam on the brakes, pull the, well, we'll pull the tail pins out of the, the back end so that the uh, back of these opened. We'd slam on the brakes, these bombs would tumble down and come into a pile. <laughs> well, when we did this, and uh, we were looking around, and, we're surrounded, absolutely surrounded. You guys were only a part of it. <laughs> we were surrounded by all American personnel. <coughs> so, Erskine says, well, he thought a minute and said, tell you what, let's play it. He said, go back and get the, we had a sledgehammer. He said, go back and get the sledgehammer. <laughs> so I went back, got the sledgehammer. Erskine gets on the bomb like this, and, and he says, okay, go through the act. I raised the sledgehammer. <laughs> Every, what I looked at, all I saw was rear ends. Everybody dove into the gun. 
<laughs> Those that could run rail, but there are so many that just ran them. Well, when I came down with that sledgehammer, of course I came down on side, I didn't hit any bomb. But they got the message. <laughs> and we stood there laughing. And, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, those, those are the kind of things that, uh, you know, you can't tell anybody back home about. <laughs> uh, well, you could uh, say they were looking for the whiskey. <laughs> oh, no, no, actually, uh, when the whiskey, uh, when we got back, uh, actually we had to wait quite some time because all the aircraft had to come back and, and we cleared the area of all personnel and we blew. We blew all up at one time. I don't know if you know how to blow a bomb, but it's, it's, it's pretty tricky. Not with a sledgehammer. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a real trick to, to blowing a, a big bomb, or even a small one for that matter. But in a big bomb, the only way you can blow it is if you have direct contact. Now, we had blocks of TNT that were all about that big, and a, a, like a and they elongated a little bit bigger than a, a quarter pound of butter. You know how the butter used to come in quarter pounds? Well, they were a little longer, a little bit bigger than that. But when you blow a bomb, you put two like that, tape them on to, in contact with the bomb. It has to be in contact. And on top, you put a third one, like that. And you fuse the top one. You don't fuse the two here. And when you, fuse, when you ignite the fuse there, that brings the blast down, and that will set off the bomb. Now, if you have two bombs, uh, and there's a separation, even, oh, this is great separation. If you have a separation like this, you can set this bomb off and not this one. But if you have them abutting or touching, you can set off a whole chain up like that, as long as they're touching. Well, when we had them all on a stack like that, it was no problem <laughs> blowing them all at one time. That isn't the only time we blew up. <laughs> We blew up half of North Africa that way. <laughs> you will see, I have some pictures here of where we're blowing up uh, uh, ammunition in the desert, and uh, I have one, I think, of a white phosphorus bomb uh, as it goes off at its height, which is quite, quite a display. Uh, well, well, getting back now to Foggia. A lot of things happen in Fuji. <laughs> if you're getting tired of this, why <laughs> just let me know. Um, I moved into a, uh, a house there in Fuji, and Erskine, being an officer, he got to go over to officer's quarters. But the, uh, the house had been bombed out, and so it was uh, empty, but it, uh, it was still a place to sleep and so forth. So I picked out a, a closet a long closet, walk-in closet type thing. And that's where I put a, a bunk in there. And I always had to sleep a, away from the other troops. Because when I came out from the field, very often I had five air ammunition. But uh, I, I'd have grenades or something like that. And uh, the, uh, uh, after I emptied them out, lots of times the guys would come over and they wanted a souvenir, so I'd give them souvenirs. Now, one of the better souvenirs was the German hand grenade, uh, the uh, Italian hand grenade. It was beautiful. <laughs> it was about that big, bright red, really bright red, uh, shiny bright red, bottom part, a ring around the top, which was uh, silver in nature, and, and uh, then it was domed over. And in that dome was housed a ball, a ball of steel about that big around. And that ball of steel was separated from the main charge, which was in the red part, by simply a tab, which you pulled out. Well, it was so easy to take apart. All you had to do was unscrew the darn thing, and they'll take the main charge out, throw the ball away, and put the tab back in. You had a beautiful little souvenir. Well. When we told, uh, the officers loved this kind of thing, and the Navy loved it too, because they, were, they didn't get on land to get these things. So all you had to do was punch a couple holes in the top, and they made salt and pepper shakers. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
we sold them to the Navy, and, and Erskine and I managed to get some butter and a few steaks out of it. <laughs>